you know, that I didn't want something that looked like I was, you know, 17 in a room with my nunchucks. And then I saw this one and said, oh, this is cool. So it's got a, another Iron Man image on this the other what, side. The coolest 17-year-old with the best nunchucks would have in his room. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I believe we're live on everything right now. So we should be good. Let me set levels. Welcome to your movie drive. Whoa, in. stop, 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 stop. There we go. Yo. All right. And... I am checking levels. Check, 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 check. Let me hear Justin. Check, check. Uh, one, two, three. This is me talking. I'm going to talk in this volume pretty much for the entire goddamn episode. All right. Uh, uh, Andrew. Hi, Andrew Main. And I'm going to talk probably like this. Except when I'm excited. <laughs> Looks beautiful. All right. Um, yeah, no. I guess I'm good. Uh, is tonight the second to last Game of Thrones? Oh, don't say that. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> traditionally, it's the best one. Uh, oh, that's usually when they have the big uh, gotcha moments? Not last year, but, but in previous years. Yeah, because, you know, this last episode was so disappointing. <laughs> Dude, it was well, so I mean, yeah, usually it's the big... Because uh, it ended. Yeah. <laughs> uh... Uh, so true, true fact, everybody. Uh, the last, I think, three times I've talked to Andrew on the phone since Game of Thrones has been an hour long conversation about Game of Thrones. Uh, yeah, man, I don't blame you guys. All right, I think we're good. Uh, here we go. I'm gonna count us in. Ready? Five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Justin Robert Young. Yeah, you're gosh darn right it is. And Brian Brushwood. Ah, uh, you're golly dog it dang doodled. So, gentlemen, uh, we got a lot of awesome stuff going on. It's one of these things I had just had to call a bunch of things because so many cool things have, have happened this week. Brian, I sent you a news article with a video clip, which is sort of we could, you know, kind of a fun way to sort of start this thing. And uh, this takes place not too far from uh, where I have a house in South Florida, uh, and it's, you know, we love to do things in, in South Florida like create artificial reefs, you know? And it's not just enough that we, we, like, we'll drop, like, some concrete blocks or an old ship or something like that. We're getting crazy artistic with our reefs now, reefs now. Like, it's, it can't just be something. It's not about the fish. Not right. about the coral, guys. No, it's about us in creating underwater things to go sightsee. The latest one is a half a million dollar installation art piece that they wanted to set off the coast of Deerfield Beach. And uh, Brian, Brian, you got that? Yeah, loaded? yeah, yeah. Here we go. Let me hit play Much on it. Much anticipated sinking of the Rapa Nui Artistic Reef Project off of Deerfield Beach started well with perfect skies and calm seas. Bunch of Eastern Island Yeah, views. by the way, yeah, you see a bunch of like uh, giant heads. It looks like it's sort of um, – uh, if Disney were to create uh, what looks like the ruins of an ancient civilization, it's Easter uh, Island. Yeah. I mean, it's Easter so, Island guys. They're like twenty foot tall and all that. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're they're gigantic. Let's also just give a little bit of context to folks who are not from the area. Number one, Deerfield Beach is in Palm Beach, which is uh, next to. It's not quite. You might think South Florida. You might think South Beach, right? Or you might think some of the hedonistic rum rudder elements of South Florida. Deerfield Beach is certainly a beach community, which has everything that goes along with being a beach community, but it is not exactly nightclubs and cocaine in the way that people might as assume uh, something close to Miami would be. It more, is far more uh, uh, the 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 uh, Palm Beach uh, aesthetic. More pain pills. Yeah. No. Certainly. <laughs> Uh, number two, these are Eastern Island uh, <laughs> you know, totems that have been erected and are going to be sunk there. Which, They're on a barge. Which, yeah, from a barge, which would be very, I mean, obviously a lot of times what this is for is for snorkeling. People like to snorkel and scuba dive. So to have some of the wildlife coalesce around these would be obviously very fun and interesting. Uh, it has no cultural significance to the area for which it is being <laughs> sunk, which is kind of well, what I mean, they're going I, for. I, we, which, by the way, I don't mind. I mean, I think we live in a postmodern universe, and if the purpose, you know, if we're going to be eco-poets for the purpose so that we can, you know, go down on spring break and snorkel around and take a look at beautiful stuff, you know, might as well, sure, yeah, throw some Easter, hey, listen, Easter I, Island I, I'm, on there. I'm all for it. I don't think everything needs to be exactly, you know, tied to where it was in historical context. I do think it's interesting that if you could choose anything— 
that you go with this specific island culture as opposed to, I don't know, like a spaceship or anything. Like if, if, if everything is going to be out of space at time, it's curious that this is exactly where they went. So what they do is they have these, they're they erected the some as high as 20 feet tall on top of a barge. And the plan is to sink the entire barge and gently lower everything to the sea. Now, now, uh, is is there a set method to sink barges? Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Why don't you play the audio, Brian. All right, sure thing. So it it seems to be going down a little bit lopsided. All right, a little bit top heavy, this barge, <laughs> as it flips on its side to the uh, dismay of some Florida citizens. And eventually goes upside down. Oh dear. So the plan was to have the barge gently uh, <laughs> lower itself down to the sea. And then what happens is one side flips up over the other and it goes slides into the sea and then the concrete things fall first and then the barge slams down on top of it destroying everything just uh, a bit outside do do do, do we get to see how how it looks i mean surely they no, took cameras no. oh they didn't no they didn't want to show us uh i don't think they got you probably wouldn't be able to at, at the time that it's down there it's probably all super cloudy yeah wow um a for effort though here, I mean, how funny is it that what they designed to be a perfectly set up ruin of an ancient time, like, turned into an actual ruin of a modern time? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe there's some poetry to that. We could say it's all on purpose, right? All part of the show, folks. What's, what's hilarious is that what you can't see is, you know, listen, I'm sure this happened sometime during the weekend. You got a lot of people in Florida. It's a, it's a gigantic boating community. What do you have? Uh, how many boats would you say are out there, Brian? Oh, it looks like easily, you know, we'll say a hundred spread around in a circle around there. Yeah, so they're all watching this, and and as you might imagine, you know, it's people out there in the Florida sun drinking, you know, the split in a case and, and just having a good time out there on the boat, like just laughing at what has to be, I mean, millions of dollars. A uh, well, half a million dollar project is what they said. Half a million dollar project. Uh, you know, and and it's also uh, I don't know, it, it's it's a fairly hippieish, uh, you know, project to boot too. That's. That's a bummer because I'm actually really in favor of of that kind of ecoscaping stuff. I'm sorry that it went went poorly for him. Well, Either. there's, I mean, it, like, it's still gonna be there. Right? <laughs> not like they're dredging it, it up. I mean, to be like, honest, it's there's not more gonna look the way they wanted it. There's to more look. of an authentic story now than there ever was associated with it, right? Uh, no, absolutely. And really, I mean, the big problem here, for whatever, how I mean, obviously, somebody. You know, the nature of comedy is somebody walks out in uh, the most expensive suit in the world and then a bird poops on them. It's funny, right? So, yeah. like, somebody spending a lot of money and uh, having it uh, having it go sideways is is going to be funny to people. I mean, look, uh, uh, as, as anthropologists have said, we laugh when we are surprised and we laugh when we feel superior. And uh, a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B here. <laughs> <laughs> but ultimately... You got, I mean, like, someone just got a decimal wrong, right? In terms of, like, how to submerge that barge. It's not well, like plus, ever plus also, I mean, in, in their defense, it's not like there's a, a federal uh, uh, study of how to sink boats in the evenest way possible. I mean, it's not like there's there's a real popular... Well, there are, I mean, there, there's... There's research, I mean, into that for creating reefs and stuff and doing that. And I don't, I don't know who... Who is the one that decides? Because, like, you know, in doing oil rigs and a lot of other stuff and doing in shipbuilding and stuff, there are, you know, there is expertise there. I don't know if the expertise could have solved this problem. I don't know what expertise was brought to bear well, on and, it. And, and I guess I'm looking through the article. I don't see the method by which they caused it to sink. I don't know if they pulled a plug or what. Well, I think, the, yeah, the idea was to strategically make the barge unstable. And and slowly pull that down, hopefully using the gigantic weight of the reef to kind of act as a way that it, it was pushed down. I guess I don't know whether or not they were sacrificing the barge itself so that would live forevermore at the bottom it, of the ocean. Yeah, it was supposed to the bar supposed to have the whole barge go down. But I think you know the problem is is like your as something starts to sink, 
you're going to get your air is going to go into certain pockets. It's going to want to start going to one area. And then you just start reinforcing that. And it's, it's a challenge. And, you know, the way that you would probably do this if you wanted to guarantee a, 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 an even thing is you would need to have other st- support structures there and make the barge already heavy and then, you know, cut the supports or whatever. Or use blasting things to make sure that all the air escapes at the same time. Um, you know, in my vast experience in naval sabotage, well, in, in sinking boats, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so uh, you just put it on Wayne Newton's yacht. High five, uh, uh, great Easter Island uh, reef sinkers. Here's to you. We yeah. we wish you the best. Good luck. And by the way, uh, I know that we do have a lot of people out there who uh, who listen to the show in all all parts of the of of the world. Uh, of course, Andrew and I hail from. South Florida. If there are any scuba divers among you, oh, we'd dude, like to take pictures. Original reporting, weird thing style. This sunken ruin. Uh, we will be very excited to discuss them. You can be a part. I mean, in fact, do we want to put a bounty? Yeah, dude. Uh, uh, you know we, what? We want to. We want the Diamond Club. Let's throw a symbol. Uh, let's let's uh, let's make the bounty uh, not a cash bounty, but like uh, I'll, I'll throw in um, a, a surprise pack from scam stuff, like a hundred dollars worth of scam stuff. No, we're doing cash, five dollars. I will give you five dollars <laughs> of my own money. Okay. Uh, I just need original pictures of the botched Eastern Island uh, Deerfield Beach uh, a situation. Go ahead and grab your grab your your, your scuba gear. Head on out. You know what? And and uh, here's the thing. Not only will you get five dollars from Justin Robert Young, but all three of us will autograph it. You will get the world's I'll only send five dollars to every one of us. We will all sign it and we will send it to you. Uh, yeah, just go to the quarter deck down there. Uh, you know, uh, there's the whale bone. I think uh, you can get a good uh, good clam chowder. It's gonna be a good I mean, time. Something tells me that you could walk down literally anywhere on the street and say, "Hey, where'd that boat sink upside down?" And they'll be able to point you in the general direction. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, this is, uh, this is, this is super, super amazing. And, and, and people are saying, should this be the weird things ROV project? You know, I'll tell you what. Oh, damn straight. <laughs> that be, that, that we can just like... drop it. Listen, there's that, there's that Deerfield Beach Pier. We can just walk into the end, just drop it and drop it on off and, and uh, have a good time. Oh, that would be great. That'd be great. We could get up there. We could report like breathlessly. Like it's one of the mysteries of the ancients. It's like, according to legend, uh, three weeks ago, a barge sank out here, <laughs> developed by insane people who spent well, we, their riches. We did a thing there once because there was UFO reports from there, the inlet. Yeah. Remember, there's like a um, our uh, underwater UFO reports and stuff are off of the Deerfield Beach Inlet. I remember we did a little weird things uh, scoping out the territory there. We did, yeah. We went out to out, out to the pier. They're actually the pier in, in Deerfield Beach is red. If if you've never been to South. Uh, or if you're in South Florida, that is one of the more underrated beaches uh, because it's not as packed and it's super awesome. Gentlemen? Yep. Yeah. I'm going to give you a hypothetical question. All right. I want to know. Um, we're all in agreement that, like, uh, you know, robots, robots are coming. Shoot. Yeah. They're, you know, they're, they're AI. at us. They might be our friends. They might be our enemies. They might be our lovers. We don't know. <laughs> but Literally. we have a new, not a new, but we have a, uh, you know, an alternative which doesn't get explored a whole lot other than like, you know, you get every now and then you get the crazy sci-fi story where like, you know, one man uploads himself and it becomes a digital version of himself and then ob- always becomes evil. Always. Because, you know, what <laughs> because else? Movie what tickets. other stories could there possibly be? Um, Ray Kurzweil. You know, that super pessimistic guy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he was head of engineering. Keyboard impresario. Yeah. Head of, head of engineering for Google uh, has come out and said, uh, and I like this quote from Googler says, <laughs> he's a Googler, you're a Googler. Googler says, we'll all be human robot hybrids by 2030. And I don't think that he said, we'll all be. You know, and that's one of the problems in science reporting in general is that it's it's done by people who are, you know, under deadlines, don't really care, whatever, and we'll just sort of, you know, uh, say I mean, whatever. But anyhow, I, you know, even even if you go with that, I would I would say everyone who has the ability to will be. 
Yes, I no, I agree. But there's a difference between one where you're talking about, you know, where's the technology going to be, and then socially speaking, that oh no, we will all. It's like, well, wait. Yeah, I I think that technologically, I think cars. Well, I just it's frustrating to see somebody twist this into a thing like, well, I won't be, you know, and then yeah. therefore they discount the whole thing. Well, no, 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 that's not what he said. That's some reporter, you know, making up this sensational headline. Yeah, it's false. Well, and it's also kind of frustrating for people to, I mean, like Kurzweil, this comment is not necessarily crazier than or or off topic from what he has been saying for years, right? But you put Google in front of it in the headline because he draws a paycheck from Google now. And now it's like, oh, big major company says we're you, you better be a robot or else get out of here, loser. Uh, and and this was at the Singularity Summit, or is this just a file photo? Yes, this was a this was the latest Singularity Summit, apparently, and this is a statement. And we t- basically what he talked about, and he and he, he kind of uh, explained the technology a little bit more in describing uh, basically implants that go inside of the brain that are basically like designed DNA. So it's not like you have big, thick hardware jacks in the back of your head and stuff, this would be very wet wear, softer, sort of, you know, uh, uh, more biological than what we'd recognize as a microchip kind of thing that connects into your head and then allows you to load up onto the cloud, back up yourself to your cloud. And he tell, it says that he thinks we can do this by 2030, by yeah. 2030, 15 years from now. Uh, Technologically, he says, Chris Kurzweil. Again, <laughs> says that we'd be able to start doing that, and by 2040, you could have we'd be doing most of your your processing on the cloud itself. We'd I, be more. I think machine that is man. delightfully optimistic, and he's proven me wrong in other ways. So I certainly hope he's right in this case. But um, man, I'll be impressed if 15 years from now, <clears throat> in 2030, we even have just uh, uh, audio implants or rechargeable, you know, permanent. Uh, hearing aid style upgrades that, that can recharge. I mean, it's like, I, I'd be impressed if we get that far in 15 years. When you say like we're hearing aid upgrades that can recharge, what do well, you mean? Well, what I mean is is um, mass acceptance. Uh, like right now, it is socially acceptable to walk around with uh, uh, earbuds in your ears, but that's a fairly dumb way to have audio, you know, whether it's, you know, constantly listening to podcasts or audiobooks or taking phone calls or receiving audio information, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, cues, you know, that's another thing is you're driving and, and you know, the, the voice comes on and tells you turn left here, turn right here. All of that incoming, you know, and also, you know, we've got uh, phones that are constantly buzzing or chiming or making stuff. All of those should be subtle auto cue, audio cues that only you can hear. Um, and socially, there's a lot of situations it's not appropriate to wear earbuds. Uh, it seems to me like that's the next, uh, just like the wrist was free real estate. I feel like the ears are free real estate for the next. I think, I think that, you know, we've seen amazing developments in cochlear implants, though. Amazing stuff that people that, you know, did not have the ability to hear sound now have that. And we can bypass a lot of the brains, you know, a lot of the auditory hardware and just sort of jack into that at some point and we can send sound to parts, you know, that where that didn't work. So that's been amazing. You know, what we need is we need that softer wetware kind of thing. So it's not like you're walking into the Apple store and they're taking a Phillips or their special, you know, unit screwdriver to the back of your head and undoing a plate and putting stuff in there. And I think that's, that's going to be the big thing is when you start creating this sort of wetware kind of thing, that's just doesn't feel that, you know, is is in, in the kind of, you know, we have stuff that if you have an impairment you use now, you know, the, the world of uh, artificial limbs is incredible where the developments are being made there, hips, things like that. Professional athletes may be actually trying to get surgery because of the improvements from certain things. The next step is you talk about like having hardware implanted. I think the big leap there is what he talks about, though, and that's the whole point is that when we get this thing, this this sort of more biological type technology like that, that's when it becomes, oh, yeah, I take a pill or I take it, I just take it, you know, I get this thing installed by taking an injection behind my ear. And then when it's six months later, it unless I get another injection, it dissolves or whatever. You know, I think that's the big leap. But once that leap happens, Man, um, uh, so wow, 15 years did that leave? Like, what wh- is there a proto version of that that exists? Well, I mean, did, yeah, I, I, I don't know whether or not we've seen anything that, like, to the likes of which he is describing, but if what he is saying is that the idea that this would be, and however we want to term, like, mass accepted, like, you know, that it would be something that people could get done legally, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it seems... 
it, I guess it doesn't seem unreasonable to me considering, you know, where we saw just a leap in like mobile processing over over 15 years. Like, you know, like what, what, what will be 15 years from now in terms of what we think about in terms of computing? I mean, let's well, not get hung up on timelines. Let's okay. Get, uh, let's, sure. Sure. Let, let, let's let's extend it and say, you know, it could be, you know, it'd be 2030, it might be 2060, you know. You know, somewhere in there, you're able to do these very soft implants in there, and 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 then the t you know the hardware. And I think that's the more interesting idea is that, you know, he's positing the idea that we have this evolution of our conscious moving moving at first we're connected, permanently to the cloud, and then we get to a point where, we're living. You know, these thoughts that are going on in our heads are, uh, trying to in my head, are well taking place on the computer. Uh, think about it this way, and uh, uh, not to go back to timelines, but 15 years ago, I mean, first of all, that's already kind of happened in so far as we have this external device that we carry around with us to connect us to the cloud at all times. We use it to find answers, to schedule things, to find out what other people want to tell us, to, uh, uh, you know, to consume uh, thoughts of other people. Uh, 15 years ago, none of this, none of this was possible in the year, in the, in the year 2000, uh, like, I, I think about how ridiculous our phones were and, and the fact that we would download stuff on our home computer and burn it out to a CD to take it for, with us to consume later. And nowadays there's this, I, I got pulled over yesterday for, for doing like 10 over the speed limit. And he was like, yeah, proof of insurance. And, uh, and I was like, uh, I think, can I check my email and just show it to you? He's like, yeah, that's fine. And I'm like, ah, oh, curse this signal. And then it's like, well, here's an email. Like, that's astonishing. 15 years ago, <laughs> you, you couldn't just say, hey, can I just show you a picture on this device that says I have insurance? And he's like, yeah, sure, that's fine. I mean, it's like, I don't know. Um, uh, once it happens, I do agree, it will happen very, very fast. But it's like, I, I guess I have a hard time wrapping my mind around the proto version, uh, because again, in, in in 2000, there were hints that we wanted this, uh, or I don't know, whatever. So once we get there, how fast does does this take over? Like, do, well, do you sign up for first generation surgery? I think you know. I think we know it's going to Larry Page and Sergey Brin and Kurzweil, and there's going to be a lot of prominent technologists who will. You know, and that's and and that's OK. So imagine Kurzweil is the first guy to say, all right, I'm going to plug myself into this thing. Oh, and here's a cool thing I can do is I can create I can create 100 different versions of myself so I can go appear on 100 podcasts all at once. Uh, and, you know, when we start seeing how that power manifests itself. Yeah. I mean, do, do you think we perceive it as not the real Kurzweil or how quickly do we accept the idea that Kurzweil is kind of a brand for the type of thinking that Kurzweil does? So he's sitting here talking like I am like, we're like, oh, yeah, da, 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 da. Oh, well, did you see X Machina? Oh, yeah, I did. I thought this da, 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 da. Oh, and we're having it. We're having a, as real of an interaction with him as somebody else is as he's having an interaction somewhere else. Well, I mean, I, I assume it would be similar to how real would people think that what we are having is right now a conversation, like a, a, a telepresence that is not the the rich analog sitting across from somebody uh, conversation. That's something that I'm sure, you know, 30 years ago, people would think would be less than authentic, whereas, you know, for us, it is the basis of, you know, our relationships. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, I mean, going back to a lower fidelity version of that, uh, in his book on writing, Stephen King makes the point that uh, that writing itself is a curious type of one-way telepathy that sits independent of time and space, is that he, and he describes the place he is and what he's thinking about and what he's looking at, and, you know, and he says, understand it's open to your interpretation. You don't know how big or small the desk is that I just described, but, you know, you, you might picture it this color or that color, but, but the fact is, is I am having an experience right now, and it is now existing in your mind, and I don't know where you are, how many years from now you're going to read this, and what part, you know, whether you're in space reading this or, or whatever. Uh, and there's, there's a, 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 I don't know, a curious power to that remote telepresence. As you put For it. sure, and I, I'm kind of fixated on the idea that once you're connected to the cloud and you're doing that, and not just the idea of like, well, now I'm I've got a digital backup, but the idea of what that means from the concept of personality. Like I said, if you if Kurzweil becomes a guy that we can have a conversation with and he can be in ten places at once, that's spooky. That is just yeah. this weird. It's it's that he, he is, you know, 
approaching something, you know, that, that, that we can't, the difference between him and us, you know, we end up being kind of closer to chimps in some ways. Well, and, and, you know, we, we, we've talked about this. I mean, I mean, imagine this, imagine if, you know, Kurzweil had spent so much time talking uh, or any public figure or whatever that like you kind of have a database sort of like uh, in Superman's uh, Fortress of Solitude. You have recordings for just about anything Superman could think to ask his virtual parents. You know, we could have that for uh, for Kurzweil, either intentionally with Kurzweil or, you know, we'll say unintentionally. You know, uh, I, I, we rewatched one of the old. Uh, introductions to a, a night attack episode where it was pointed out, you know, that thousands and thousands of hours have been recorded between the three of us just talking about every potential thing. And if all of that were virtualized, categorized, and uh, and set up, you could very quickly parse a question and then get an answer from us about that subject. Right. I, but I'm still hung up on this. My Brian, imagine right now there is Brian one, Brian two, Brian three, Brian four, Brian five going out there and doing Brian stuff. And then tonight you guys rejoin up and, and go back to master, you know, Brian prime. Yeah. You know, well, or, or, or maybe even, I mean, maybe there doesn't even have to be a rejoining up. I mean, if there's some kind of, if you're connected to the cloud, why not a persistent con uh, connection between all of you? This is something that uh, in the dreaming void trilogy, Peter F. Sure. Hamilton talks about like a, uh, you know, in a post-singularity world, it's not enough to just back up your consciousness and then build another body when, you know, you suffer, quote-unquote, body loss as the euphemism. Instead, it's like uh, the, the end thing is to go multiple, and there's this awkward moment where after making love to three or four copies of this one guy, she says, wait a minute, how many of you are there? They're like, like 50. What are the other ones doing? It's like, well, right now, one's doing actuarial tables, and the other one's doing, you know, uh, sweeping out the gutters, and the other one's doing this. So think about that. Just think about the idea that like either, you know, the, you know, the, there's Brian prime and all these other satellite Brian's what is and, and I mean, they could all be, one could be physical, but the other could be virtual existing in virtual space and doing stuff to me. I mean, that's just like, it's like, I it think changes the human question. fundamentally. I think, I think once that happens, I think the idea of, I, I think there is no Brian prime. I think, I think each of them are legitimate and uh, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, you know, I, I, I think the, well, the only reason why a hierarchy would be beneficial is if there is argument, right? Like, like the idea that there is a, or, or, I mean, this is something that we cannot know, but like, is there the capacity for argument? Like, you know, what is the limit to where we can argue well, with oneself? And I think that you get into, you're, you're going to, because of time delays and things like that, you know, you're going to have these little subtle differences. And, and I like the idea of, and I think it could be choice. It doesn't have to be. There is always a prime. You know, if, if one Brian wants to go to Mars, well, guess what? You know, that guy's got to be a standalone unit because just you can't transmit that information instantaneously. Right. You know, well, well, for while he's away, but then he comes yeah. back and I feel I would imagine that I feel whole with all six units in contact with each other. And one unit may go off the grid to do something and come back. And um, and maybe he does something different than outside of the heat of the moment. The other Brian's would would it's like it's like hearing about it is like, oh, I really wish you'd done it. But the moment you uh, sync up, you realize everything that went in. And you're like and all the Brian's think, well, I would have done the same thing in that situation. But but then again, like if it, let's say even if they don't like what he did. What you're describing is the phenomenon of being disappointed in yourself, which is something I experience every morning when I wake up and think about how the previous day went. I was like, oh, I really should have worked out, should have done this. I'm really disappointed in you, past Brian. Well, and, the, and I think that you might have like, I mean, you might have discreet ones that are like, well, you know, guys, this has been great, but I want to go off and do my own thing, you know. And like, well, well all right. Man, you know? that would be a fascinating element to a story where, let's say, there is – the, you know, multiple versions of somebody and one of them decides to go and live in a small town. Uh, and then all of a sudden one day, another one decides to go to Mars. Then one day the one from Mars comes back and all of them, uh, after it rejoining a more consistent, uh, you know, shared cloud basis, all of them instantaneously have a rush of understanding reality as, you know, a part of, uh, you know, the, the part of them that went to Mars, you know, part of them that sacrificed. Maybe there was like some, some poop went down on Mars and then friends were lost and it was a harrowing experience. Then all of a sudden you go from flipping, you know, burgers in a diner in, in uh, you know, Michigan 
to uh, being a space traveler, at least an element of a space traveler. The so, kid that comes back after his first year away at college, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah, I know but imagine like now all of a sudden it's just it's part of you. It's you. You did that on some level. So, uh, so I like this idea of like picturing an element, like for whatever reason, he's just in a different situation or whatever, and they decide to separate the bond and then they come back. And even though they're genetically identical and they had the same, uh, up upbringing and so on, um, you know, they've just been detached for say five, six years during this Mars journey or whatever. I would imagine the experience of coming back and talking to yourself without that cloud sink, um, you know, uh, lock, uh, uh, catch up is a, a little bit like meeting an ex where it's like, you know, cause when you're dating someone, when you're in, in the thick of it, it's like you share everything and you feel completely connected to them and you, and you kind of act as a unit. And then that breaks down and leaves. And then like when you meet an ex years later, there's that weird detachment of like, huh, crazy. We used to be a thing. You and I, you know, we used to be the same person and now we're not. Uh, I would imagine it's a lot like that where it's like, wow, can you believe all of us were the same guy? Or maybe a twin. Uh, yeah, but but a twin, I don't think well, has I mean, the emotional we're, we're, connection. We're dealing with it's like it's like like no, it would be more like gin, or it'd be more like vodka, and it's like well, yeah, I, but I guess it, it, is, it is elements is, of alcohol. The sexual right? like, component is what throws me. Is like well, there's that like oh, well, I mean that's the thing that throws me. Is like well, like you know, like this pair bonding thing that got broken apart, and that's you know the, the all the well, the no, no, no. Uh, uh, and, and, and well, in that in that regard, I regard I, I feel like the sexual element is a proxy for the level of intimacy and the uh, you know it's like when you have sex with someone, there there's something strange about it where it's like it is an act completely without uh um uh, without you you drop all filters in in that moment and as a result you share something that you don't share with anyone else ever and and never outside and uh and then when that ends like no longer do you have that coupling that connection but the secrets remain and y y all you have is the memory of like we used to be at a level where we would share this kind of intimacy and now we are not uh, I guess that's what I'm thinking of, uh, except it's intellectual in intimacy or emotional. I hear, intimacy. I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. I yeah. Get, I, yeah, absolutely. I think that there is. It's these are weird questions which we may have, you know, on a distant weird things podcast. Dude, Brian I, three, I, I, Justin I guess, eight, what, what, Andrew two thousand. You these know, will be. Uh, and and to like when uh, Brian, I totally understand your. Like, like meh, I don't know, time frame, like you know, uh, reaction. I, I I pick up on that, but. What I do know is every year of my life, I've been fascinated and blown away with what like is accomplished, right? And so now the idea of thinking, the most exciting element of being alive right now is thinking, wait a minute, what's the surprise? Yeah. Like this, it, it's like watching Game of Thrones. It's like, well, what, what's this year's surprise? What, what, what's this year? What happens now that makes us completely open up new territories and, and new, uh, new, new, like not only just new inventions, new fields of inventions for which impossibility is the is the only uh constant you know so uh i saw ex machina oh doggone it <laughs> it was at a significant glance my way i thought our agreement was that we were going to wait until it was rentable uh well, no, our agreement was we're all going to see it in theaters, and then we all saw Mad Max instead. Yes, no, and that's fine, but but I I, I thought last time Andrew and I had peaked well, in I said, on it. We're not gonna, well, I said we'd hold off the discussion until it was rentable, which is going to be like June 26, whatever. I had a friend Friday said, do you want to go see Ex Machina? And rather than go through the torturous explanation of be like, well, I'm a flake, my buddy Brian's a flake, and we've been <laughs> kind of flaky, and to make ourselves feel less flaky... You know, we all decided that, uh, you know, oh, let's just go see it. Um, uh, there will What'd be an inter there will be several interesting discussions, I think, that will stem from that that can relate back to this. Um, I, I, I thought it was that was a very well done film. And, and it was it's not it's not the plot I would have written, but it's a very, yeah. very well done plot. Yeah. You know, it's what not the way a, that I think would be things a comparable would play out, but I think that film. he did a, a wonderful way of 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 telling the story. Uh, I don't know if you heard Justin just asked what a comparable film would be. In, I guess in terms of uh, in terms of plot, or are we looking at a Planet of the Apes, a Fight Club, uh, a, uh, a, a two thousand one? Uh, you know, it's 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 hard because like the number of like a source really, code. Well, I mean, of really, really, really good uh, sci-fi that's that can be reduced down to two or three person sort of dramas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, is you know. 
it's it's primer, you know. Yeah. Or, or moon. Yeah, and so, dude, if it uh, if it's in the same clubhouse, I mean, as flawed as it was, you know, I love me some primer. As flawed as it was, I loved uh, upstream color and moon. If it's in that ballpark, then I am in, in, in. I mean, it's it's Alex Garland who wrote and directed it. He is the guy that wrote the book The Beach was based upon. He is the guy that wrote Dread. Uh, he is an extremely talented writer, and this is his first boot as a director. And I think he knocked it out of the park. Great. Um, all the performances are fantastic. Very, very, very well done. Well then, okay. Well then, I will. I will. Uh, I think it's still playing at the draft house, so I'll make the effort. Yeah, to if you can see it. Don't. I'm not yeah. going to hold. I'm Brian. We. I said that the. You know, wait till video. We can wait till. Wait, if you can see it before, well, I recommend. No, well, no, it, no, but. no. Like, like I almost went this past week, but I was like, oh, that's right, we're doing video. I, I won't yeah. do it. But, but I may sneak off and see a matinee yeah. or something. Justin, do you see it? No, you didn't. I've not. No. no. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think uh, it, it gets into a a and a big question. I think that we've talked about this before, which. Uh, you know, you have the ability to create multiple versions of yourself. It's not a plot to the Indian X Machina, by the way. Um, is it's like, what do you do? You know, I, I've been I've been going back and listening to like old kind of turn of the century and older, you know, nineteenth to twentieth uh, motivational books. You know, as a man thinketh and things like that. And then a little bit later on, Napoleon Hill, yeah, all that. And it's Some Dale it's, Carnegie. It, yep, yep. You know, and and with you know, and it's interesting because there's a theme there. Which, um, spoiler alert, uh, Napoleon Hill, he talks about what the secret is, what's the whole secret that it's about that the men who are the most successful men in the world have learned. Yeah. Free will. <laughs> <laughs> right on. They can and decide I, but to it's do not something. A, I don't say that in a light way. It's that once you realize, oh, you know, the reason this person succeeded, this person does, because this person said, I am going to do this and I will not stop until I do this while other people would give up or whatever. Yeah. But that comes down to the whole idea of desire and determination. We, if we create, you know, super intelligent robots or copies of ourselves, we got to, well, what are we going to do? You know, what's Brian number? If you had a Brian to Justin, you had a Justin number two, mm -hmm. what would you assign him to do? Well, I mean, initially I would probably think if, if he was a separate entity for which was, you know, I mean, I guess <laughs> the, what I would want to do is tell him to do all the things that I don't want to do and that yet I have to do, like that I have to be a part of. So right now it would be like planning the wedding. <laughs> uh, I, I, would, I would have him do that. The reality is that if there was a Justin too and I told him to do something, he would probably tell me, no, why do I have to do it? You do it. Well, and plus also like uh, all of the, the kind of – selfish, you know, non, we, we all have our list of things we know we ought to do, you know, and then, in, and there's stuff we choose to do instead. Part of the reason we choose to do it is because we want the pleasure and the memory of it. But if it's like, if it's a case where it's like, Hey, you, uh, if it's a case where you're going to sync up and get the full benefit of those memories, either way, then you kind of, I would assume don't really care whether it's you or the other guy, or in fact, like, and it's not even like you would keep track where it's like, why do I always have to do the hard thing? Because you wouldn't remember which one of you did or, or even care. Like once you sync up where it's like, Oh, why am I always the one that has to uh, get the email box well, clean? Yeah. But also like in, in, I was having a conversation, you know, the other day, uh, about, you know, writing partnerships, and, you know, like talk about Matt Stone and Trey Parker and how you have one guy really is the big driving force behind it. One guy is the guy that really does most of it and really handles it. But the other guy is an important part of it and an important part of that team. And there doesn't seem to be an animosity between them. Well, and it, well, and I would say that they are both equally important in that clearly, uh, and I forget which one is the one, that, there's one of them that is better about Trey writing Park. the first. Trey, Trey, Trey Parker's the dynamo, and, and Matt Stone uh, is is incredibly important and has been there since since day one. Well, yeah, there was, I forget where I read it, but there's this breakdown, this ebb and flow, and if you ever watch uh, Six Days to Air, I think it is, uh, the yeah. documentary Breaking It Down, you see the, the dynamic between them where it's like, in the idea genesis phase, they're both barfing out ideas, spitballing back and forth or whatever, but they reach this moment where it's like they've gotten enough of the ideas out that it's now time to get a first draft written. And it's not productive to have both of them, you know, take one page at a time. That's that's the part of the machine that needs one part to synthesize. And what happens is, you know, uh, Trey goes and, and writes a first draft and he's just spent and he comes back and he's under pressure and he doesn't have what it what it takes, you know. And and you know, I've seen this, you know, as we w worked on the pitches for hacking the system. Uh, I I 
uh, love. I, I, in general, I, I see this in the emails that I do with John, uh, with the pitches we did, and this, the script ideas for hacking the system. Um, uh, I love molding something there. I love, I love editing. I love, I love taking is like, Oh, if you move this and piece this together, then this would flow much better or whatever. And, and I also love idea Genesis. It's just that blank page that I can't, I can't spit even a first draft out. Right. But and, I, I guarantee you if, if, if Matt got mono, uh, South park would still come out. If Trey got mono, South Park. I mean, that's happen. fine. If you, if you want to decide that you could pick a, a winner of that relationship, I, I don't know what the value but, is but, in that. Brian, but, but I mean, it, it definitely. Uh, it, it, I, why, you, you equate it to a winner. It's no. I, I, it's a weird, weird way to go. I think it's they, Matt, you know, the, the, the Trey and Matt, Trey likes to have Matt. Matt needs to be involved, and Matt is very much involved with it. Trey can pull all the switches and can do this sort of stuff and make it happen. Maybe not for very long, you know. But, no, I mean, I mean you're, you're right, but I suspect if it's anything like. My, if that's it, nothing if, like yours. But uh, go ahead. Okay, that's fine. Um, whatever. Uh, it, uh, my my guess is you're right. He could, but I'm also going to guess that he wouldn't. And if right. he wouldn't, then that's the same as he couldn't. You know, if 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 absent of of Matt, Trey doesn't do anything, then clearly he couldn't do it on his own. Cle I, clearly, well, I think he we feels... could get a couple episodes out of him, and I think that then it would, you know, he needs Matt, you know, is, a, is an integral part of keeping the thing going. And I guess my point is, is that, like, he's a person that's probably doing the lion's share of the of that creativity. Matt is a person that's helping him keep moving along. And that's like I'm getting into is we talk about, like, having and splitting into different personalities and stuff. There's a relationship where there's not a lot of argument because, you know, uh, Trey, you know, Trey, Trey finds Matt an integral part of it, although Trey is the guy who from the outside is doing most of the lifting. Yeah, no, I and I would definitely agree with that. Well, and there's also for them, uh, they are two guys who are certainly not without egos and, and deservedly so considering what they've accomplished. Uh, Matt is a intense part of that relationship just because it appears from and this is just being a fan of their work and either watching stuff and reading interviews. Matt might be one of the few people on earth that can tell Trey his idea is dumb and they need to change it. Like, you know, there's there is an element for which they they very much believe in in not holding anything sacred and making sure that it's it's all good, but when you've accomplished as much as they've accomplished, it's easy to be like, "No, uh, I'm a comic genius. I say it's good." It's good. And to everybody else, I don't know if, if many people hold that weight in the way that, you know, they, they look at each other and say, yeah, if somebody thinks this is BS, then it's probably BS and I need to change it. Yeah, that's interesting. It's sort of, uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, going back to the stuff we talked about, about, you know, the left and right hemisphere. Um, uh, I, I, yeah, I don't know. Well, I mean, because really, how much of that is is life and, and good decision making, and even the free will that you know uh, Andrew has, has rescued the knowledge from uh, the the turn of the century that uh, it, it's it's not necessarily making the decision; it's sticking with the decision and sticking with the decision. The real, you know, the what goes into that sausage is dealing with failure, dealing with self doubt, and dealing with. Uh, progress making sure that you're gaining progress so you know you can mitigate the self-doubt with little doses of like i'm at least making an inch or two of progress or i feel better about my output and what if that wasn't an internal dialogue what if that was you had your own writer's room you had your own i mean that's the greatest thing about six days to air is that not only matt stone and trey parker but also you bring in guys like bill Hader and and, and writers that they've worked with forever that they're you know what if that is, you know, the the Herman's head as a dated reference and inside out as a modern reference, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, all the little pieces that put together this larger whole. But it's all us, you know, like that's that's amazing. That's crazy. Yeah, man, it's weird. It's uh, uh, reading incognito uh, back in the day. And, and uh, I, I know, Andrew, you've you've expressed uh, some hesitations about some of the ideas in it. But the idea that um, that the brain is a consensus it, the, the the brain is basically congress and you know you got left brain right brain are the democrats and the republicans and granted one side or the other could run the country on their own it would look very different either way or you know mostly it'd look the same but there would be some very significant differences but that but that you know actions and decisions are made when both sides reach consensus uh i i don't know that's a very um uh that's a very interesting idea to me that's very persuasive. Yeah, that's David Eagleman who wrote that. I'm friends with David. 
Um, and David's very, very, very smart guy, very intelligent guy. Um, you know, and it's, it's my, mine was more about the, uh, the, the research into, uh, does time expand or not? It was, you know, like, Oh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, like slow that. down. And yeah. Cause it just, I did, I don't know if experimentally that was as robust enough to find out or not. Cause it's, it's one of those things like anecdotally, there's yes. so many accounts of that. And you're like, I mean, maybe does it expand after the fact? And is there some process that takes place later on that then goes back and then is able to decrypt that information before it's lost. And there are a lot of these little factors that come into play, but anyway, Eagleman's Vela, I very highly recommend reading Eagleman in, in your suggestion of incognito. Um, Eagleman's very, very, he's funny cause he's a, Brilliant neuroscientist, but he talks like this, dude. Oh, does he? <laughs> like, yeah. I've never, I've never heard him talking. I, I, I think yeah. his book was read by someone else. Yeah. Uh, hey guys, I know we're kind of running toward the end of the episode here, but I, re I got to share this story. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. What you got, Brian? It's a tale of love. Love's good. Yeah. It makes the world of, go round. Of of yearning, of magic. Mm-hmm. Of evil spirits. If this is about Hearthstone again, I don't think it's going to go over well with the audience. No, it's not. Uh, but it is almost uh, as expensive as uh, <laughs> having a Hearthstone addiction. Uh, it is a tale for which, by the end of it, we'll have erased 713975 dollars Seven hundred thousand dollars, almost a million dollars, almost a million dollars. Okay, now is this is this your story? No, this is a story that comes to us from the windswept hamlet of Brooklyn, New York. A uh, thirty-two-year-old Brooklyn man, yeah, uh, meets a girl, not to be. She, uh, you know, he's he's in love. She wants nothing to do with him. Oh my God! So he decides. You know, he's just love, love, Lauren, can't figure it out. All of a sudden, ends up almost by serendipity in front of a psychic. Walks in. Psychic tells him, I can, spirits talk to me, buddy. And you two, you and this lady, twin flames. It's only the fact that evil spirits surround her that you guys are not together forever. All right. I mean, right. let's trust, uh, you know, I, these spirits, they are, uh, they're uh, uh, psychologists, they're, they're therapists, they, they, they know a lot about relationships, or they're just dead people. Uh, all right, well, here, let, you're, you're, you're the guy, right? Okay. I'll, I'll be, uh, I'll be the... Uh, I'll be, uh, <clears throat> hey, the... Uh, uh, look, <laughs> this is kind of nutty. I was just walking by, and I saw your sign. I'm, I'm in the middle of a bit of a relationship crisis. There's a girl I really dig. Uh, do you th could, could, could your connection to the spirit world help me? Could, could you give me insight? Absolutely. Dude, we can get this done immediately. Oh, that's All great. All I need is twenty five hundred dollars. I mean, that's rather expensive. Uh, but I'm I'm gonna assume. I mean, you got a sign and you're hey, in listen, the yellow I mean, pages. You want true love or not? No, because, no. I mean, yeah. like, true love uh, is at the end of this. If you just give me twenty five hundred. In, in the great scheme of things, twenty five hundred is nothing. Let me grab that. I, I'm just gonna hit uh, six different ATMs. You know. Also, by they... the way, you are a a, a uh, young professional mm. doing very very well in New York City. Oh, great. Yeah. No, I can afford this. So let oh, me yeah. go to seven ATMs. Uh, hit the limit on each of them, and I'll be right back. And a boop, boop, boop. Uh, okay, uh, we do a few consultations. Listen, this is a bit of a of a real sticky situation. I'm gonna need nine thousand dollars more. Well, I mean, yeah. You know, just to recap, I know we've been doing this for a week. What have I gotten so far out of this relationship? Uh, well, number one, I've identified the spirits. Uh, oh. I know where uh, where they're affecting her psyche, and oh, I know right. exactly what we need to do. I just need nine thousand dollars, and then I can tell you what the solution will be. Well, well wait a second. You don't you don't need this nine thousand dollars. This is probably going to some sort of purpose, though, right? I oh, mean certainly. In fact, by the way, I mean, come on. Uh, I, I got ahead of myself. You're gonna get all this money back at the end. I just oh. kind of need some operating capital. So it's so, sort of like an investment. Yeah. Yeah, no, I get investment. Hold on. I'm, I'm going to go uh, uh, cashier's check. We'll be okay for this, right? Cool. All right. All right. So uh, I've done a little research. You are going to need some diamonds to ward off the spirits. So I found this great, uh, this great uh, talisman that will uh, help you. You don't even need to wear it, by the way. Oh. You just need to purchase it. Uh, you can give it to whoever you want. Uh, you know, I would, I mean, like, I've always loved diamonds personally, but like, well, uh, I, as your assistant, let me point out, okay, 
you know, Justin is going to be dealing with the evil powers and yeah. diamonds protect evil. Diamond, nothing's harder than diamond, right? It's oh, science. yeah. No, no, no. It's Im impenetrable. I mean, evil can't penetrate, you know, that the, the carbon network. So yeah. unless you want the evil to attack the person trying to help you. No. Yeah. yeah. So good point. Good point. I mean, we need to shield you, right? You're out there in the trenches battling evil. They have nefarious thoughts in mind. We got to we got to shut that business down. It's just $40,000. All, all at once, or can we do an installment uh, payment no, plan? No, you kind of Tiffany's doesn't do a layaway, bro. Uh, mm. You kind of need to just uh, all run right. that card. Uh, listen, I'm gonna go uh, take out a quick mortgage. Might You've be a week. You've got some money. You've got a no, business. no, no. Yeah, yeah. No, you're good. You're good. Yeah. Oh, great. Uh, great. Uh, well, it's more than I plan to spend, but uh, heck, in for a penny, in for forty thousand. That's what I say. With this ring's power, I have warded off the spirits. Great news. So, so she'll she'll take my phone calls now because that's you what was... are gonna head to Los Angeles. Yeah, you need to go to her. We're out of the woods, bro. You are about to be united with your twin flame. Oh, dude, I'm excited. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna book the ticket right now. So, meanwhile, you go to Los Angeles, make plans. Uh, initially, your your long lost love says, uh, "Sure, yeah, we're in." Then you get together. And you're ready, or sorry, you're about to ready to have a fun night on the town. She backs out, doesn't answer your calls. Oh, oh, oh. It, it must be the evil spirits because she said yes, and then she pulled back away, right? So let me let me just call my psychic real quick. Beep boop boop mm -hmm. beep boop boop. Bring. Hello. Uh, hey, uh, what's up? I think the evil spirits got through. I think there's something wrong with the talisman because we were gonna go on the date, and she totally pulled pulled back. That's what that was. Wait, because I was just sitting here and I was like, wait a minute. Is that is that a breeze or is that an evil spirit? Like it was like 50 50 for me. Like I didn't know which one was which. It, it had to be that evil spirit. Here's the deal. I just kind of need twenty eight thousand more. Uh, also, I need another twenty eight thousand after that. But we're close. Uh, oh, OK. And just just so I can explain to my accountant, this is all going to. Uh, so it, it's it's to to bring you because here's the thing we're so close she obviously was reaching out to you the evil spirit again uh, uh, you know it took hold of her also uh, you want to know what you might as well just go ahead and add on to that we're gonna need to have a fake funeral right just to bury the evil spirit so on top of the two installments of 28k we're gonna need another 40k to do this thing right. Right, right. I'm still on those first two. two like, what are we buying with the 28,000? We need to stop thinking. All right, so here we go. So the 28, the 28, yeah. good for it. I'm just, in fact, I just have your card. I'm just running it right now. What? Don't worry, you'll thank me later. Right, okay. Uh, 40,000, we're going to do our fake funeral right. Okay, good. Yeah. Turns out um, that isn't exactly what we need. So bear with me. Okay. All right. Yeah. What we need is for you to go back in time. <laughs> I'm sorry. That that uh, is that is that you you mean like on a spirit quest or in a time machine? Well, no, no. Sorry, you don't go back in time, Brian. Justin would be going back in time. Oh, yes. on my behalf, I need to go back in time. And Brian, cleanse. you wouldn't know what to do. Yeah, no. Yeah. Well, you screw I mean, it up last do? time, you'll screw it up again. Right, but, but, but I, I, that's like putting a dog behind a wheel of a car. You know, what do you, you expect them to drive? Sure. But, but, I mean, but that's, like, I got to go back in time. That's that's a thing you can do? You have that, yeah. that, that talent? I mean, if you don't think that that's plausible, you could just go ahead and uh, I can do most of what I need to do with just another talisman. This one needs to be a watch. What kind of watch? Well, you well, can't listen. use any crappy Seiko watch. You need a very, I mean, yeah, quartz is the most precise time measurement you can commercially buy. But, no, you need a really precise man-made. So here's the thing. Uh, I can, I'm, I'm, I'm texting you right now um, okay. a menu of all the watches that we could do. Uh, you know, you are a man of, a man of, of exceptional means, and, and you really you want to show that you're taking this seriously. So I would assume uh, that the top one, which is a rose gold Rolex for $30,000, would probably be most to your taste. Uh, I, sure. And this will let you keep track when you go back in time to yeah. battle evil. Yeah. Uh, in fact, you want to know what? I just already got it. Oh, oh good. So you, you, thank you. Yeah. Turns out... 
Good news, bad news. Yeah, yeah. Good news. Got the watch. Yeah. Looks great. Bad news. It didn't. I, I, I came close. Oh, man, so well, close. You, you, yeah, you went back to battle the spirit, but you need a way to trap the spirit. Yeah. Joy. See, you know, I mean, like, like, let's like, go I'm back doing and kill best. Hitler. Oh, we forgot to bring a gun. Right, or we forgot to put a, put a cage. Like, you got Hitler in a headlock. And then yeah. he's all like, ah, Mein Kampf. He's like, that's right. And then and then you're like, what do I do now? You're like, well, I'll, I'll get him next time. I'll tell you what, man. I bet you you're sick of spending all this money, right? I mean, I, I look, uh, I'll do what it takes. I mean, it is it is a little more expensive than I thought it'd be. We got to finish this. I'm tired of screwing around. We've been out here pussyfooting with this here spirit, making sure that you get the lady love for which you have desired. I'm tired of it. We need to end this once and for all. Right on. So what do you suggest? The only thing we can do. The only logical solution. Which, of course, is... I mean, I, I, I'm surprised we're not saying it. it. Three, two, one. We say it at the same time. Okay. All right. Three, two, one. I An call 80 her. 80-mile bridge of gold. <laughs> well, I, I, I said I was going to call her, uh, but it sounded... Maybe it was something weird on the, the connection, but it sounded like you said an 80-mile bridge made of, of, of gold. And when you say gold, you don't mean painted gold. You mean it's made of, of, of the gold of... Uh... Yeah. Well, I mean, in the nether realm, of course, bridges to lure evil spirits are made of gold. We Can need an 80... virtual goods, Brian. Have you ever paid for a virtual good? Yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. Uh, yeah, so, so this. Oh, oh, you're not saying we even actually build it. We virtually build it in the spirit realm. In the spirit world, yeah, it's an eighty yeah, you know mile what a bridge. Would cost goal. for that alone, let alone the gold. <laughs> it's, it's a good point. So how how is there an exchange rate between my? Do how many U.S. dollars does Man, this? Man, you are in luck because I got a guy. We're gonna hook this up at a price. <laughs> it's gonna be sweet. <laughs> okay, how much? How much are we looking Woo! at? <laughs> oh man, it's like you're gonna look. You're at the end of this. You're gonna be like, man, I might as well have got it for free. I'll tell you what, man. When I first walked in, uh, it did not occur to me that you would end up selling me a bridge. But here we are. <laughs> so here's the deal. Uh, and by the way, my guy is taking a bath on this. All right. Okay. Like, all right. Just he's soaking. At cost. $80,000 for the 80 mile bridge of gold into the nether realm that will trap the spirit forever. <sighs> forever. Yeah. I mean, forever. look, I mean, we're, we're, we're a half million in at this point, right? I, I guess I should just go ahead and jump in. Uh, of course. All right. So we built the bridge. Um, hey, so uh, boss man, Justin. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I l listen. The bridge turned out wonderful. I think mm. the spirit's gonna go across it. It turned out really good. Yes. The th thing is, it's like you know, he he's in love with her. I think her spirit might be trapped on the other side though, and we need to get it back. And it'll probably have to be a little bit longer though. Mm, yeah. No. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, so uh, <laughs> here's the problem. Uh, is is this the point in which we want to have him? Check Facebook. Um, yeah, I think you know we're like, hey man, thank thank you. Like you come, you show up. I'm at the front desk. I'm like, oh, so glad you can make it here. Things are going really, really, really well. Why are you crying, sir? <laughs> what's, uh, what's the What's the matter? He's I go, Justin. He's, he's crying. He's like blubbering. Yeah, something uh, about he looked on Facebook and um. So I it think turns she died. out. Yeah, she's been dead for nine. Days. Oh dear, that would explain why she hasn't been returning my phone calls. Drug overdose, and oh. maybe, <laughs> maybe that would explain uh, uh, right, why so she's on you, the wrong side of the you bridge. You come in, you come in, and and and, and confront, uh, uh -huh. confront. Uh, look, man, what the hell? What is this? She's been dead for nine years. Days. days. No, nine days. Nine days. Nine days. She's been dead for nine days. Yeah. Can you believe it? No, uh, no, no, uh, no. You told you told me that if we build this bridge, it would protect her from the evil spirits and that we could get her back. Dude, scumbags. They got her. What, what? We thought we had, we thought we'd box this mother in. <laughs> and then just when we thought we had it, it sprung out of the only crevice of that beautiful 80 mile golden bridge and struck this beautiful okay. flower. Well, remember, down. I, guys, I'm sorry. And Bri, Justin will tell it to you. But, you know, you did kind of hesitate a bit. 
on giving mm. the money for the bridge. Yeah. Wait. I mean, maybe if we had built that bridge a little faster. I mean, not, listen, I'm not one to point fingers here. <laughs> But, well, you know, I, like, if maybe we would have built this bridge a little faster. All you right. Know, tell me. Okay. The, Remember was, that other guy that built the bridge when we asked him to? Press oh, oh, my God. <laughs> hey, by the way, you might have heard his uh, Warren Buffett. That's, <laughs> yeah. who, that's right. who he real, is. Real quick. Let me press pause here because I'd really like to think that the next thing I do is file a lawsuit in this scenario. <laughs> Please tell nope, me that's what I do. Not there yet. Not there yet. Oh uh, no! Listen, I know you're a little broken up. <laughs> yeah, obviously, a little bit. Obviously, listen. These spirits—they're very, very tricky. Yeah, there's, Justin, no, there's a you, great, there's, yeah. there's. I, I have one yeah. thing I need to tell you. I okay, what, what's that? I don't, I don't think. Do you think Brian? Do you think Brian would 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 be willing to go? Do you think he loves her enough to go for that upgrade, that special package? Do you think he loves her enough? I, you want to know? Like all I've been doing is getting yelled at by me and my friends hanging out at uh, the psychic club mm-hmm. where we all talk about our, our life, you know, and, and, and our, our work. And all they've been telling me is, oh, old slow to build the bridge, McGee. <laughs> he doesn't need it. He's not worth it. Like, but I'm saying I believe in you. I think, all right, if we can work it out, and this, I'm just going to let you know, it ain't going to be cheap. I can resurrect her. Holy crap, bring her back literally from the dead. Yeah, I'm going to reincarnate her. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, no, uh, how, how, much, how much is that? Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know what where it is from here. Uh, it was another couple $28,000 uh, installments. But eventually, uh, you know, I'm like, hey, listen, figured it out. Reincarnated, bro. <laughs> High five. Woo! Oh, oh so she uh, well, we're... reincarnated, reincarnated. So, so, so you'll give me your phone number, right, or a name, mm-hmm. or a, or an image of, yeah. of of where where should I go? Yep, Los Angeles. Oh, it, it it won't be easy for Justin to do this, by the way, and it's gonna take a lot of time. And I tell you what, like he's been so busy working on us, he forgot to pay his rent, so we might need a little more money. Uh, like, yeah, dude, uh, uh, let me just real quick cover your rent. Uh, what is that? Uh, uh, two two grand, maybe. Yeah. Hey, by the way, I just noticed that um, you know, uh, you uh, I've been you sold your car, you used to drive here to the psychic shop, and now you're taking the subway. I mean, and, uh, uh, you know, it's 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 uh, I mean, that's fine, it's all worth it for love, right? Am I right? High five, uh, and also, fellas. you're borrowing the money now from from friends and family, you've pretty much uh, spent away your entire empire. Well, here like, in New like, York City. like you said, I'm I'm accruing assets in the spirit realm, and uh, they'll they'll be dividends, you know, that they're investments, uh, but here you go. It's uh, the new Michelle. New Michelle is here. I, I, uh, uh, go to go to L.A. All right, I, I'm going to L.A. Uh, this address right here. Just show mm-hmm. up and say hi. Yep. Well, she, she might be there at some point. You know, at hometown buffet. You know, a lot of people walk through the doors. All right. So, so I guess what I just look for her, and is it the kind of thing where it's like I'll just I'll know her when I see her? That kind of deal. Sure. Also, she's thirty one. And not 31. Oh, I mean, that's, I would imagine uh, her spirit would occupy a young, more vibrant. W- w- so you have a particular person in mind, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes, we do. All right. And you got a name. Yep. Yep. Okay. Right on. Yeah. No, I'm going to head on over and introduce myself. Uh, and <sighs> so things don't go well. And uh, you determine that Michelle is not inside this woman. Uh, yeah, look, we hung out, and uh, I asked her what her favorite song was, and she said an Elvis song, and Michelle was a Beatles guy, girl. So I'm afraid this clearly is not Michelle. Uh, I asked her to play Hearthstone, and she said... The number for the mailbox you have called is full. Please hang up and dial again. <laughs> All right, let me let me try, try it again. That's a little bit weird. Let me call the same number I've called a million times before. Beep, 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 beep. Uh, it's at this point that you file a lawsuit. Wow. But against whom? I mean, do, are we able to find the person? Or? Uh, no, you don't file a lawsuit. Oh, no, no, no. Sorry. No, no. You just go to the, uh, you go to the, you go to the police. Uh, uh, yeah. And so, and so. And the, at and this point, according to the New York Times, he had lost his apartment. He had had enough and returned to New York, sought out Mr. Uh, Nygaard, and they went to the police in May. 
Uh, the bank statements were given to the detectives. He was out a grand total of seven hundred and thirteen thousand nine hundred and seventy-five dollars. His name was Mister Nygaard, straight out of uh, freaking uh, uh, Fargo, uh, uh, the, the TV series. That's amazing. Uh, meanwhile, the police uh, arrested uh, Miss Del Moro, the psychic, and her companion Bobby Evans, May twenty-six, in a restaurant in mid uh, a restaurant in Midtown, Midtown Manhattan. In which the writer, uh, not unfairly editorializing, I believe, uh, points out for dramatic effect was a steakhouse. Uh, they were charged with grand larceny and to this day remain in jail. So here's the thing. For it to be grand larceny, wouldn't the state need to prove that they knowingly were defrauding this man, right? Uh, yes. Like, hypothetically, and I'm not saying that now, this is the now, case. No, hold on, wait. I need, I need you, well, here, let, 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 let's get to the end, because, like, All right. I, the, this, this article is written in a very annoying way, uh, and, and yet there, there's the, the final, the final paragraph is, is actually kind of a thing of beauty. So let, let's get all the, all the questions out, and then we'll, we'll wrap this segment sure. on the final paragraph. Uh, oh, oh, well, so my questions are, are just, you know, like, um, uh, in a sideways universe where she actually believes all this with her heart, and, and to be honest, you know, we've seen lots of cases where so-called psychics are able to convince themselves after the fact that they really did have this ability or believe their, their stuff. Like, if she actually believed, is it, is it fraud? Yeah, it is. I mean, no, that, that's not the... The definition of fraud isn't contingent upon what the person states that they believe because a, a car salesman who sells you a beat up car that's new and says, no, I believe this to be real. I believe this to be real. Like, well, yeah, but we found the statement in your office, you know, where you bought this and the paperwork said that it was not. You can claim whatever you believe. But if the evidence shows that this was, you know, not likely to be true. You know, it, yeah, yeah it's I, I think I think the big itself. the big key would be whether or not like what she did with this money past getting it Got beyond it. like you if know she said that she was going to give this money to someone or spend this money in a way to do things like like uh, in the audit she would need need to point like yeah no she this needs to show her receipts on the on the uh, uh, foreman's cost and. Uh, Netherrealm uh, permits for building the 80 mile bridge of like, gold. Right. Like, often, like, what they do is, like, in the gypsy scams, is they'll do, they'll take the money and they say, okay, we burned the money. Yeah. Correct. And you show the money was not burned, you know. You all know, right. Like, that, oh, that's I will fair make enough. A donation that, to X or whatever, and that did not take place. Yeah. That, that definitely makes it. Okay. All right. All right. So, so I'm satisfied. We're going we're gonna to throw these guys into jail. Uh, now, here is, I mean, just the, Brian, I just need you to read it in full. Again, this is after. Seven hundred over seven hundred thousand dollars of his own money is taken. This is the final paragraph of this New York Times story. Uh, you know, sitting here recalling my uh, disappointment, uh, it was when I met New Michelle that I had this thought: "Quote, <laughs> you know, Del Maro may not be everything she was purporting to be." <laughs> <laughs> After after seven hundred thousand dollars, and you meet this new chick, and you're like, you know, maybe she's not everything she says she is. <laughs> oh, That's I mean, amazing. It, it's so sad, right? Like, I mean, and, and obviously, listen, we we are all people for whom have found fascinating uh, on some level the the world of uh, you know scams and cons and carny elements and and you know the idea of of, of the sharps and the marks and everything, but. Holy smokes, man. Talk about a, you know, uh, a, a, a New York City swindle uh, on, on the scales of which, you know, is just uh, so iconic. I mean, I want to know I want to know this guy's backstory. Like, how did he make that money? Um, like a marketing company. Yeah. Wow, yeah. I you know, feely. Make uh, it, make it dummies buy things. No, what, no. <laughs> well, but but also, I mean, that tends to be a very kind of touchy feely uh, uh, way to make a lot of money, and uh, you know, because like if you told me he was a network engineer or something, I would have been uh, a lot more surprised. You know. Yeah. No. I mean, it was. It's certainly something that. Uh, yeah, you know, you just you hope that, man. At some point, hi everybody. My name is Justin Robert Young for the Weird Things Podcast. <laughs> If you or a friend have started pouring a ton of money into a fortune teller, hoping to reunite you with a long lost love, please talk to them. <laughs> like at some point, <laughs> just just be like, "Hey, man, you want to know what? Let's just 
Let's just have a have a chat. You know, tell someone you love that you are spending hundreds of thousand dollars on a fortune teller who is you know making you buy things at a thirty thousand uh, dollar a, a a a appointment clip. Yeah, and I I will tell you too. What's insidious is I have I have a friend whose mom was educated woman, you know, nurse, you know, had nurse, all this very very smart woman. And she had this shaman or somebody she would go to and then like, you know, show up one day and there's this like six foot tall giant candle thing or whatever. And like, oh, yeah, no, it was it was a gift from this woman and all that. She would never admit that she was giving this woman money, never admit that it wasn't giving money because it was always coached in something else it was like because it's a friend or somebody else says she's not going to ask you for money if you could help her out. There's it was there are all these insidious ways it takes place. So you ask like, no, she's never asked for anything from me, never asked for anything. like, OK, has there been any flow of money from you or to a cause or something she supports? Like, oh, yeah, there's this charity thing that she says that I should support, you know, and it's like this for benefit Nepal or some other, but not the Nepal charity or whatever. It was always these other little things. It's like, you know, she's been bilking you ten thousands of dollars, you know, and it was just and I just I'm like, this is obvious to anybody standing outside looking like, yes, they've given you intelligent reasons for you to tell yourself, no, no, I'm not. She's not bilking. She's my friend and she's my close personal friend. Yeah, and it, she's exploiting you, you know, and that's that's what's one of the problems of being wealthy is there's a lot of people around you that will take advantage of you. Well, and wow. for you know, I think we all we all have a stake in what the point of the power of storytelling is, right? There is no, I mean, this we we told a great story right now, telling this man's story. He was living that story and lived it in a world and bought the idea that just around the corner was the most amazing tale of his life and you know that's 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 the power of getting hooked on on an idea hooked on a feeling uga chaka uga chaka hey uh man we're at 70 minutes do you, do you think it's worth it to push picks to after things because surely let's do that okay because there's there's a lot of stuff i, I want to double down on talking about the content there's a lot of good content coming out uh do All we just right. want it for people who, who only listen to weird things that we just want to say the picks and then discuss them afterward or like did we, Great we Escape, want this to be streaming a now on Netflix. Uh, what is it? The Great Escape, streaming on Netflix right now. The Great Escape, uh, the original or? The original, yeah. of course. Uh, right on. Uh, the uh, Yeah, I do want to talk about that. Uh, I'm watching Sense8. Watched the first three episodes. want to talk about that. And, uh, and, I, and I, I went and saw uh, uh, Rick and Morty uh, season two preview uh, with Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland uh, uh, last night. It was really, really real good. It was fun. Uh, I will say uh, FSL Tonight. If you like this show and you like me and Tom Merritt, uh, the new season has begun. Head on over to FSLTonight.com or Patreon.com slash FSL Tonight. No more Kickstarter, all Patreon. And you can get behind-the-scenes access, the likes of which we have never, ever offered before. Yeah. It's been weird. Awesome. Uh, okay. Show title suggested by Gambling Man, uh, Cloud People. I like cloud people. I like cloud people or eighty mile bridge of gold. <laughs> I, I also like eighty mile bridge of gold because that's one. That's one that you can listen. Cloud. You can listen all the way up to that point and not see it coming <laughs> when, when, when that that turns out to be what he's buying. Uh, give me one second. Well, folks, it's that time of the week again. We're Brian and Andrew. Go take a pee, and it's just me and you. Um. Hope everybody's having a good weekend. Um, mm, 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 mm. I'll tell you what, this uh, Bay Area summer, we have not had this, uh, not had this studio with all these lights. Um, as the sun has gotten hotter, and uh, man, our apartment is steaming, Willie beaming. Uh, Tensor Guy, great interview with the cam lady, by the way. Oh, yeah, no, uh, the jury interview series has begun. Thank you to everybody for getting jury over $500 an episode in recognition. You know, initially we were going to do like a hangout, like everybody does a hangout, but I mean, hell, I feel like everybody, there's there's enough access to me. You know, everybody's got my email. You can, you can get access to me all the time. Everybody does that. What everybody wants is more content. So uh, now jury for the same price... Uh, per episode is now 
a five episode a month proposition as opposed to a four episode a month proposition, uh, you get an interview um, that will happen each and every month. The first of which was with Doxy, D O X I E. Uh, she is, and I believe this probably in order, a artist, a hardware hacker, a maker, a blacksmith, and a cam girl. If you are interested in any of those elements or just the base idea of what goes into the life of a, uh, a pro uh, cam girl and uh, how much do they make, uh, then you will uh, very much enjoy the uh, the interview. She's super, super rad. I very much enjoyed uh, uh, chatting with her. So if you like that, go ahead and check it out. It's it's free. You know, jurytalks.com, J-U-R-Y-T-A-L-K-S. Uh, but if, uh, if you dig it, then go ahead and, and check it out because now that we're past 500, I think I'll probably do a, uh, I'll do a 750 goal, but uh, we are on the march to... A thousand. If we get to a thousand, then uh, we are basically at this being far more of a full time gig than anything else. So go ahead and check it out. Um, JuryTalks.com. J U R Y T A L K S dot C O M. Yeah, I was just telling everybody, Andrew, about this uh, new interview that I did with a lady who uh, is a, a hardware hacker slash cam girl that designed uh -huh. her own system uh, that scrapes the chat logs of the uh, the site that she broadcasts on to uh, have her own in underwear uh, marital aid, I guess would probably be the FCC way to uh, define it, uh, begin to vibrate in frequency based on the tips that are, are uh, entered in. And it was her own... Uh, hardware hacking system that uses uh, it was it, it's an Arduino uh, processor that uh, she had to write her own code for to uh, to make it all uh, incidental. So basically, she doesn't have to ask for anything. It's just you know a a seamless process in which her device goes off when uh, the the money comes in on the in uh, site currency. It's 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 it, she was she was a very interesting lady. Check it out. Uh, uh, Doxy, D O X I E. That's special. Uh, All right. I uh, watched uh, the uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's yesterday. Oh, I saw you tweeting. Well, here, let's let's start up. I want, I want, can we talk about it on After Things? Oh, it's an After Things. Sort okay. Of thing. All right. I, um, I saw you tweeting uh, exuberantly that you'd cracked the code of women. I was joking that like everything you need to know about women you can see in the first two minutes of Breakfast at Tiffany's. You know, it's more of just sort of a joke, but it's, it's like you know, just just Audrey Hepburn gets out of a taxi in the morning. She's elegantly dressed. Clearly, was spent the night somewhere else though, and she's wearing you know nice you know nicely dressed. She's got coffee and a croissant in her hand, and she goes to stare in the windows of Tiffany's to look at the stuff as she eats her croissant. You know, and it's like this this the the the, the iconoclast between the things was just the clashing between the two things was interesting. Like this explains so many girls I know, so. That was it. Right on. And then some girls were upset that I said that. Well, uh, Bonnie, I, I I would love to hear Bonnie comment on it because uh, she's watched and rewatched that movie. Oh, Bonnie yeah. did comment on, on Facebook. Oh, what did she, she say? Yes, exclamation point. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Gentlemen, we ready? Ready. Oh, yeah. Three, two, we're at 7623, uh, Bryce. Three, two, one. This is the After Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Yo, yo, yo. And Justin Robert Young. That's me. So, uh, do we, do we, we promised to dive into our, our picks in the After Things segment, um, Man, there's a lot of good content. I'm, I'm a third of the way into uh, Neil Stevenson's new one, uh, Seven Eves. Um, mm -hmm. I think I mentioned it last week because uh, I just gotten it started. And I, 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 do do you guys think you're gonna read it? Uh, sh should I talk about it or keep it spoiler free? Or I mean, I'd say keep it. I mean, if you want people to read it, then I would keep it spoiler free. Um... I mean, the 
the conceit, I, I guess we, we could talk about the universe uh, that is set yeah. up. I, I don't think any of this is spoilery. Uh, literally, on the first page, uh, you, you watch the moon blow up. Uh, which yeah. which sounds ridiculous, but the idea being that there's like a you know a small uh, you know fast moving uh, black hole left over from the creation of the universe is zipping through, and it happens to zip through the center of of the moon, and it breaks apart. And at first, everyone's like, "Yeah, now we have seven tiny moons. That's great." And then they start banging into each other, and they're like, "Oh, let me run some numbers." And then it's like the, an exact date comes up where it's like, "Yeah, we got two years until." There's so much debris that the atmosphere catches fire and all of the planet Earth is sterilized. And, um, you know, as you can imagine, you know, there, there a lot of it is about the heroic effort to throw as much stuff into space as we can. And this this doesn't take place modern day. It's clear from a few uh, context clues that, I, I don't know, it's anywhere from 15 to, to 40 years from now. So mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there was one moment that I was out on a, a walk and uh, and I just grinned involuntarily e uh, ear to ear when and it, there wasn't a lot of talk about, you know, who did what, but they're talking about uh, uh, getting one of the first shipments in and they say, uh, and as the International Space Station docked with that with the Falcon Heavy, uh, blah, 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 like like the, the casual uh, name drop of, of SpaceX in there made me incredibly happy. But it's it's funny because, uh, you know, much like The Martian, you know, deals with a lot of, uh, you know, kind of fictional technological solutions to very real stuff. Like you get to learn a lot about orbital orbital, orbital mechanics and so on. Uh, but you it's all underneath this heavy blanket of, you know, knowing that the world is ending and, and you know, the government handing out euthanasia pills and uh, everyone going to work because they don't know what else to do. And, and it's like the whole world got, you know, a diagnosis, diagnosis that the, the cancer is terminal and stuff. Uh, and it's uh, it's I'm about a third of the way in and we're finally at a place where. I, 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 I don't know. There's at least something to look up to because the whole first third of the book has been nothing but uh, but just just grappling with like, no, seriously, this is what the end of the world would look like in this situation. Mm -hmm. And this is what people would do. Well, um, I mean, it's no secret. It's it's about colonizing space. You know, that the book is deals yes. with that. Yes. Yeah, so. Uh, uh, but but so far the whole first third has been very heavy, very sad, uh, and I'm looking forward to to it moving into a happier place, which uh, Tensor guy in the chat promises uh, does happen. Uh, no, I, I, I'm yeah, I'm only a third of the way in. I uh, I love love uh, uh, Anathem. Yeah. Um, I haven't been able to get much into in many of these other stuff that he's, he's done in the last 15 years, but Anathem is like one of my favorites of all time. Anathem is a good comparison because Anathem was a strange world, but by the time it ended, I loved being there. I loved the strangeness and the otherness of it, and I and I, I just, in fact, it's the only audiobook that I finished and immediately went back and started again, just so I yeah. could experience the beginning of it, you know, knowing what everything meant and not not being overwhelmed by the jargon. Same for me. I did the same thing. Uh, but uh, Seven Eves, so far, I mean, it's as rich and as detailed a world as Anathem, but uh, not not as fun. <laughs> not not a place I I'm really excited and thrilled to be at the moment. So. Yeah. And that's a S E V E N E V E S 70s. I finished the book Hope Entertainer of the Century, which is the Bob Hope biography by Richard Zoglin, and I think it's totally fantastic. It's just a great overview of a guy whose legacy stretched from he started off doing dance halls, then he went to vaudeville, then from vaudeville he went to he did Broadway. And then from Broadway, he started to do radio and film and television. This is a guy that's made had six different kind of careers at points at which everybody else drops off. And I guess that's a subject of a George Burns book. George Burns talks about all his friends and just the fact that people who couldn't make that jump. And Bob Hope was a guy that was making was born in 1903, you know, shortly after the Wright brothers. And this was a guy that was still doing stuff you know, up until like 1990, you know, in the nineties even. And, and, you know, finally just his conditions, you know, his early Alzheimer's and all that got to be too bad, but he lived to be a hundred. He lived to be a hundred years old. Um, incredible. 
So as a I, I learned a lot from there. I mean, the guy is his he was a workhorse, a constant philanderer, but it wasn't a you know a sensational book that like, oh, let us tell you about here's a thing you you know, most people didn't know that. But yeah, that's not the narrative like here's his secret. Like, guess what? Most rich and powerful men in Hollywood are like that. What was really incredible was this guy's work ethic. Uh, you know, they got into the fact that, you know, he wasn't necessarily a hugely deep guy. You know, the people, you know, you talk to him and he's a friendly, amiable guy. He was not a guy that reminisced. He was a guy that was about the work. When he was 85 years old or something, he did something like 170 appearances that year. I mean, to be honest, he sounds like, I, to be honest, from what you've said, it, it, born in a different time, it sounds like uh, Jay Leno, you know, like uh, from everything we hear about Jay. There is there is there is a lot of similarity between you look at you have some comedians are guys who do their thing and that are deeply personal, you know, uh, deeply private, like Johnny Carson and Steve Martin. You know, these are guys that do their thing and they don't they're not like the life of the party in the middle of the room. Hope and Leno are would could you know John, Jay Leno drives himself to the car shows, hangs around, talks to everybody, does that. Bob Hope was like that. Absolutely, there was a lot of similarities between the two of them. And you know, and that's that's a, just an interesting sort of like different. Letterman's another private, private guy. Letterman goes and does his shows. Then Letterman's off in his ranch in Montana's. And I also think it has to do with like guys who tend to be more intellectual. Um, Carson was intellectual. Steve Martin's an intellectual, uh, you know, Letterman's, you know, pretty thoughtful kind of guy. They, there's, there's this weird sort of thing between the intellectual entertainer who's on and then they're completely off and don't want to be on versus guys like Hope and Leno who just seem to be like, hey, everybody, how's it going? How, what, what did you think of the final uh, week of uh, Letterman, both you guys? Uh, I actually didn't watch any of that, but, but um, you know. I didn't watch it. You didn't? Uh, man, how weird! I, I only watched I watched the clips. Uh, I, I didn't watch any of the full episodes. Okay, okay. Then I'm thrilled to hear this because, like, if you told me when I was in college that, like, uh, like it would be a news event, and yet n not me and and all of my closest friends just wouldn't even be bothered to find out that stuff. Like, what does that say about the changing face of the way we consume television now? That that like, what was what was our big outlet? For remotely countercultural, sarcastic, you know, one of our late, he was our guy when it came to late night. Yeah, but then the it 90s. became a, then it became a machine and a business, and not and not taking anything from what he did, but it was it was not he was a guy that was clocking in and doing a very good job of, it, but it wasn't like, you know, the days of monkey cam and stuff like that were behind us. Well, you know, no, I see, I don't think that's what it was, or at least not for me. I, th I think that it's not that he changed, but but the structure changed to where the late night show, the opportunity to say the things that were on everyone's mind that you couldn't, you know, say out in public and you, you had to wait till the sun went down and the kids went to bed to say it like the Internet destroyed that like. The internet destroyed the relevance of of having that pulpit. I think. I mean, and me, but I, I don't know that it's. I, I I mean, my experience is different than yours. And I think I look at you know who's a guy that I think is doing something really clever is like John Oliver. I think John mm -hmm. Oliver is doing a very very clever and saying okay, everything's happening in the moment. So let me do a thing that goes uh, goes back in time a week and says here is this thing and let me sort of address it. And and there's a reason why I think why I like that versus. Uh, you know the uh, uh, was it the Jeff Daniels thing? Um, oh, the newsroom, the newsroom, newsroom. You know where newsroom was. You know, just fan, you know, just it was Sorkin as hell. And I mean, I love Sorkin, but that was just you know uh, wish fulfillment. Like you know, like ah, and like people like yeah, it was so great when he said that. It's like all right, you just you're just make believe. It's it's like me wanting to pretend I'm wearing Tony Stark Iron Man armor. You know. Um, but anyhow, uh, but I think that there is some very clever stuff going on out there. I think for me, for like Letterman, like Letterman kind of ran out of surprises for me. Well, I think there is undeniably an element where, you know, I think what never went away for Letterman was the monologue. The monologue has kind of always been, it was for Leno, it was for Carson. I mean, Carson famously was uh, email it, faxing and, and, you know, sending monologue jokes to Letterman for years after he left, uh, you know, the, the tonight show, because he just couldn't help, but write these one liners. They were just always a thing. I think that never went away for Letterman. Um, what I think changed for him and he never really was the final kind of nail in the coffin was his heart attack. You know, they, uh, Letterman famously used to prior to his heart attack, take 
two Hershey's chocolate bars, break them up into their little squares, stack two towers of squares up, eat all of them, and then drink like four cups of coffee and go out. And that was his like ritual to do it. And eventually, like when his heart attack happened, that was part of the behavior that he had to he had to knock off. Uh, I think his mental desire kind of went away. And, and also I think there, there came a, a, a time when he could find purpose in life beyond his expression on, on that show, which had come to define him, which once you kind of let go of that, here's what I do think. I do agree with you, Brian is like, it's not necessarily that the internet changed everything, but competition got wider. Attention got thinner. And, uh, now if you're not trying but your hardest, there's somebody else who is, you know, there, there was, there's a, a staff of writers at the daily show at, at the Colbert report that are working diligently because they want their legacy to be these shows and, and they want to beat, they want to be the the thing that everybody remembers. And, uh, I think that for him, that, that went away. Now that, that doesn't mean that he wasn't amazing. I mean, the, the, the greatest relationship I have with the Letterman show was probably in the late nineties when I was uh, staying with my my father in, in St. Thomas, and I would watch, let it, like CBS was the only station that they got in St. Thomas uh, of the American broadcasting, uh, you know, uh, channels, and I would watch Letterman religiously, and would you know just die at you know, know your current events and know your cuts of meat and you know all these kind of late Letterman sort of bits, and I I loved it. I loved him. I, I mean, he's 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 a genius, but I do think that he ran out of steam and, and, and I think it was, it was pretty clear, uh, you know, in the last 10 years that, that his children, uh, people that he inspired, uh, comedically had, you know, uh, struck down the master in terms of, uh, of, of, of who was doing the kind of comedy that he made famous. Right. And, and, and I, you know, I, I, I think we sort of ended up in kind of two different spaces, but, uh, you know, my, my point being like, to me, the remarkable thing is not that, that, you know, that, that his show was ending, but just that, uh, that in the wake of his show ending, three people who love what he does just, you know, in a world now where we're just spoiled for choice and there's so many different nuanced flavors of, I mean, it used to be if you wanted that kind of sarcastic humor, uh, it, 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 he was it and that was it uh, in the entire all of broadcast landscape that you got. Sure. I, I think like, you know, there was a there was a kind of a really wonderful sort of period between like, I think like 1975 and maybe 1985. You look at you know, you had, you know, Letterman coming onto the scene and doing really clever and, you know, and taking that late night slot and doing anything and everything, monkey cams, things like that, bringing on guests that you would never put on another talk show. You would never put it on because it could totally derail everything, but it was going to, you know, KMR and bits like that and stuff. Crispin Glover, like, that famous uh, uh, weird ass. Uh, never thing invited back, by the way. Yeah, I'm uh, sure. But, but, you know, but like there are the people, you look at who do they bring back because like, oh, we love the way it gets drilled, you know, Penn and Teller, et cetera. Saturday Night Live. There was a time back in the day you watched Saturday Night Live. You might see a comedian do that spot. You might see somebody else other than a musician go in there and do that variety spot, and it was really spontaneous and felt special and different. They did an entire episode about when Buckwheat got shot that was a parody of the Ronald Reagan getting shot, and that was brilliant. It was brilliant. And then they stopped doing those kinds of things, and Letterman stopped doing those kinds of things that became – you know, they would do these little outrageous, funny bits and stuff, but they really, once it became, this is what it is, You, I know I could watch a show today that wouldn't be that different than three years ago or whatever. It was not going to push that. And that's when it started being like, okay, you know, it, this is the same format that everybody else follows now. There, I could I could interchange these bits with other shows to a degree, you know. Uh, you know, you know, and the, and the only the, the main, only difference, like, okay, well, Fallon will invent a reason to spontaneously pretend they're trying to sing, you know. Um, but that's the thing for me is like, yeah, it just it's the envelope pushing ceased to be there. So that's why I kind of lost interest in Letterman because it was like it just felt the same. So I mean, I, I do think that like <clears throat> there was there was a time in which that time slot and that idea was synonymous with irreverent comedy. You know, and, and and that was something that certainly seeped beyond, uh, beyond beyond that that point in terms of visual, irreverent comedy. You know, yeah. uh, the sketch comedy was you know uh, became became bigger at different times during the during the day, and that was, you know, uh, you know even at the point where he went 
we first went to CBS, you know, and, and that's, I think ultimately that that's also part of it is the idea, you know, that maybe the show was never, you know, David Letterman will always be artistically remembered more for the late show than he will be, um, or the, for late, late night, night late night with late David show. Letterman yeah. than he will be for the late show. Yeah, agreed. Uh, are, are you guys going to check out the Wachowski new thing on Netflix, uh, Sense8? Yeah, probably not. I, uh, I, yeah, I've, I've, nobody's given me a compelling I, reason. You know, to. it's, it's, it's beautiful. Um, I, I, I'm going to watch all of it. I think, um, the, the first, the first episode really is long on the set pieces. It's about eight people who find themselves feeling each other's emotions and sensations or whatever. And it's got, uh, Naveen Andrews, the guy, uh, uh, from, uh, Saeed. Lost. yeah, Saeed, uh, you know, and, uh, it has an interesting setup, but uh, it is long on the personal vignettes and short on the moving forward with the weirdness. However, by the end of the third episode, there is a really cool crossover moment where one of the eight people is a, a cage fighter, right, basically, and um, or underground boxer, and another one is a disenfranchised a uh, small business owner in uh, who just got robbed by uh, you know by by some local thugs and goes to get the money or it, they steal his mom's pills and uh, and there's this cool crossover moment as sort of the skills of them are being lent you know interchangeably I I don't know it, it sounds like from what I'm seeing in the chat there are people it kind of comes and goes um, but uh, I don't I don't know I, I'll I'll plow through it and let you know if it's really worth it but for right now it's it's really fascinating and you can see. Some interesting uh, echoes of of um, w what feels like knowing the story of the Wachowskis uh, feels like a personal take on stuff. You know, there's a, a there's a there's a transgender uh, character who's who's and and, and it's curious because it sounds like it's somebody who's fully transgender uh, or you know uh, fully transitioned, I guess, and uh, and in a relationship with another girl. And then there's another character who is a, um, a, a Mexican action movie star who's deeply closeted and needs to cover it up at all costs. And so one, one of the one character is in uh, San Francisco and the others, you know, in, in Mexico, I don't know. It's some fascinating stuff in there. I just, I just hope they tie it together and, and make me just excited about butt kicking there. I'm going to take a wild guess knowing the Wachowskis <laughs> their, their and say, record. hold your breath. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't I, hold your breath. I like, I, I dug uh, what they tried for in cloud Atlas. You know, I loved the fact that Cloud Atlas, they were trying to make a film into that. They were trying to tell this big kind of story and all that. And 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 I enjoy it on certain levels. And and I appreciate that. I read Sense8 and I read like this. Yeah, this sounds like a very personal kind of thing that's, you know, nominally. I, I, I don't get a lot of sensational interest out of those sorts of things. I'm kind of like, you know, like, oh, this is what I want to do with myself. Well, that's great. You know, you should be feel like you're a welcome person anywhere and everywhere. That's the extent of it, you know. <laughs> yeah, I get you know? the problem with Sensei that that I kind of had looking at it on a conceptual level is my relationship with the Wachowski's work past the first Matrix has been fairly spotty. I really dug Cloud Atlas. Uh, I have not uh, girded myself to uh, try and watch Jupiter Ascending uh, yet, but Ooh. from everything that I know about Jupiter Ascending, it's certainly you know it is. A, uh, you know, reminiscent of when uh, everybody was really, really into the resurrection of Eddie Murphy after uh, Dreamgirls. And then uh, he immediately follows it up with Norbit. I feel like we were all kind of ready to give the, 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 the Wachowskis another chance after Cloud Atlas. And then they drop Jupiter Ascending uh, in, into our laps. Uh, the idea of a project with them, shepherded by them, that ha that is A, longer, and B, has less oversight over their ideas uh, did not necessarily seem like the most uh, delightful way to spend my time. Yeah. yeah. And it's weird now, too, because, like, we're, like, I've heard people tell me, like, oh, Wayward Pines, that's pretty good. You know, I've heard a couple of people tell me that. And I'm like, I'm like, well, like, I don't know, Shemalian, but I'm like, well, like, listen, I dug the hell out of Unbreakable, you know, and I even enjoyed yep. science. And so I'm like, like, yeah, there's, there's a guy in there that can really entertain me, and I, if that's there, then that's that's awesome. Then I want to I want to see that. Uh, but it's this weird kind of thing where, you know, with with Netflix and Hulu and Amazon, the idea that you can create something and it doesn't, you know, when you do TV, you know, like broadcast television, it's like, you know, if it doesn't hit that night, 
first night it comes out, they write it off. You know, it's like, nope, it's done for the most part. There are exceptions to that kind of thing. Or they, they pick their winners and losers ahead of time and they don't give things the chance to sort of breathe or whatever or find audiences. Wait, this is, this is which institution? Netflix or? Which one? Well, I, I'm sorry. I, I could. Are you talking about Netflix right now? When you're saying they pick their 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 winners and losers, broadcast. Broadcast. Okay. Yeah. Broad, often that you know they figure out what they'll sink money into and what they won't. But then, you know, and then ultimately, you know, where these things are decided. You know, I mean, and it comes down to it's like you know you can have something that's very clever, but it won't get the chance to succeed. Cable's a little bit better about that. You yeah. know, um, but you know, but with Netflix and stuff, it's, it's interesting. You know, they. You know, like an HBO, HBO makes bets on stuff and a bit better, uh, you know, they have a better sort of, they can take a longer approach, but that's the hard part. And it's cool though, is it like Netflix with like Daredevil's probably been one of the most successful original series for Netflix ever. I mean, and, art- artistically, I would say so. Although, you know, by, by the awards numbers, I think it's Orange is the New Black, right? I'm, I'm talking viewership. Oh, There's actual. Okay. Well, as far I, as anyone knows, I mean, yeah, I was about to say they don't release those like, numbers, right? No, what I'm saying, as far as what we they've the, the 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 firms have been tracking that stuff and trying to say what have been what we know and said, as I said, probably one of the most successful ever based upon that tracking data. Wow, is, yeah. you know, is that uh, it's been yeah, Orange New Black critically absolutely, but it's like you you take a look at uh you know uh, Mad Men, which. You would think from the attention it got, it was a hugely watched show. But Mad Men was not a hugely watched show, but critically no. it was a very successful show. But from actual watching, like for, for Netflix, the, 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 the rumor has that the story is, is that it has been ratings-wise, as far as total viewers, it's been like one of the, the most watched uh, view, watch things. There was a thing came out in Variety, which was, uh, it says, it looked in, it, it tracked what the uh trying to fig- guesstimate what that is and again it's probably no less or no accurate than other things but they list like what is the most what the most watched percent of s- subscribers who tuned in for the first 30 days after each series premiered daredevil had like almost double anything else including uh house of cards unbreakable kimmy schmidt marco polo bloodline etc i don't see orange is new black here too which certainly is a popular show but anyhow point is there's a show that had a wonderful word of mouth too. You know, it was one of these things that people talk about. Have you seen it? Have you seen it? Have you seen it? And then you got a chance to see it. And so much of now, like you say, you know, Brian's brings up Sensei, and I'm like, people rave about it. I'll go watch it. Yeah, if I'm out here and raving about it. I'm not gonna go watch it. Yeah. Well, what's fascinating with Netflix is where our idea is on their batting average because you know, by the nature of their just like you can watch whatever you want uh, sort of model, like their failures sort of just recede to the back very quickly and their right. successes remain kind of front and center. And so every time that you look at there and you see like, oh, look, Daredevil, Orange is the New Black, House of Cards. Uh, those are all things that people I know like and people talk about very fondly. Mm-hmm. Uh, look, Netflix is a great place for original uh, original drama. And yet who knows what their batting average is? I mean, I would suspect it's probably better than certainly better than broadcast where 90 percent of everything is canceled within five episodes but uh it's 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 amazing they've they've done they've done a really really good job of uh of minimizing their failures plus also they have the ability to do the unusual like uh, you know take something like hemlock grove where it's like normally in the broadcast world you're like uh not enough people are watching we're pulling the plug because we suspect that this bandwidth could be better served with something else. But but knowing the rabid nature of, of fans of the horror genre, you know, I assume that they're able to look and come back and say, hey, it made this much money, we had this much share, we had this much people, we suspect that we could give you this much reduced budget and you could do it again if you want. And then, and then it's like, you know, you're, you're Eli Roth and you're like, yeah, we, we're happy to do it at that amount or not or whatever. And it, it, keep in mind, I made that whole situation up. Mm-hmm. But uh, but it's one of those things where there are so many solutions that allow to keep things alive that in a broadcast environment or cable television, you'd have to make this binary, you know, do or don't do. Yeah, well, in broadcast and cable, too, it's like you take a show like How I Met Your Mother. Uh, that was a show that if you just looked at the ratings, it didn't justify its renewal. But where it fit into their block of programming and what they went to their advertisers with and said, well, we bring our demo down. We get a younger demo, which you want. And so we'll lose money in the slot on this show, you know, to keep it going. You know, and it, it, it's, it gets into these very, very tricky sorts of reasons why things keep on. And it comes down to is, 
somebody has to pay for it. And when you're Netflix, you're like, oh, we need to give people a reason to spend nine bucks a month with us. You know, and it's much more you're trying to please the person paying you, which is the I mean, subscriber. To, to, to be well, honest, there's, there's I mean, also this difference between broadcast television and Netflix, which is broadcast television is is King's Landing, right? Whoever sits on the throne not only needs to make sure that they are justifying that the reign that they have is 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 fruitful for for their network, but also that they are getting the credit and killing and strangling the heirs of previous kings is a very big part of that. Turnover yeah. uh, guides decision making on a level that it, it it has not at Netflix, which has only had one CEO and uh you know has a little bit more of a a a stable long-term solution of like hey look let's put this money here if it makes us money then good we do more of it if it doesn't then we don't let's get aggressive on things that we believe in let's uh you know and and whether or not that goes well or or bad is part of a longer term solution in a way that you really just can't if you are running a a broadcast network because you know nothing's promised beyond next season yeah yeah Hey guys, I'd hate to bug out early, but but we only have a few more minutes of sunset to record the stand-ups for Scam School, so I'm gonna have to go soon. Oh, Brian! I know, it's on me, bro. You and your go-getter mentality. When will enough be enough, Brian? Uh, hey, by the way, that secret project is looking real good at uh, happening. The one I texted you which we'll talk about in a future episode. That's a tease right there. Checking my text. Uh, well, well, you sent a response with a good question, so I talked to an expert in that regard, and the expert seems to feel like it would be a good thing to do. And so, uh, Yeah, I think if you do, you just, just make sure they save it in case you change your mind. Yeah. Well, and, you know, and they can put it back on you. Put it back on me. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, sure. <laughs> um, okay, Brianna. Yeah. <laughs> blink. <laughs> That's not going to be my new thing. I'm going to say something subtle and then go, blink. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. Dude, thanks, guys. It's been after. It's, it's, You're goddamn right it is. It's been after. Uh, yeah, it is the hardest thing on the planet to not talk about this because it's just too early. Uh, but uh, but it looks real good. Cool. No, I think, you know, yeah, you got my, my note on that. And that if you look at it from that point of view, then it's, ah, oh, okay, you know. Uh, what was the name of the uh, the episode on this one? Um, yeah, I'll just write Bridge of Gold. Cloud people. Cloud people got. Well, that was a weird thing. So what was the name of this after thing? Oh, no, no. I, I'm just talking about for the file. Oh. Um, we do need a title for the. Uh, hey, you, you, you. Uh, uh, monkey cam. Oh, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Uh, all right, it is almost uploaded, so I'm going to shut down the butt. Thank you very much to all of our friends over watching at Alpha Geek Radio. You guys are rad. Bye. 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 Go back to off air. You got Alpha Geek Radio? Uh, we are off Alpha Geek Radio. We're still live on Diamond Jawa, 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 Jawa. Just talk about my sand people. All right, hold on. And I'm going to start this uploading, and then I'm going to shut down the Diamond Club feed, and then I'm going to run off with Brent. Hand in hand, skipping into the sunset. Is the secret thing the thing that you went on the secret trip for? No, 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 no. The secret thing is the place. Oh, uh, you ever see a movie called Ghostbusters? Yeah, no. So that's the secret thing is still in 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 looking good. Brian's yeah. getting the library card. Uh, yeah, no, I'm putting I'm putting together a team to evaluate the uh, uh, to to help usher in the era of the secret thing. We're getting a Statue of Liberty. We can we can now <laughs> come forward and let you know that we're going to control it with uh, 
with uh, uh, a Nintendo controller and everything. Uh, rad, dude. Yeah, yeah, I'm very excited. Um, uh, uh, the biggest thing was just wondering whether I was crazy or... Uh, we got confirmation that the secret thing is very, very rare and certainly very, very rare this close. And so um, that made me very excited about making this happen because, you know, our, our weird set of requirements for secret things makes it difficult. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. That it has to be. I think, uh, and I think it can serve an extra function too, which is good. Yeah. Yes. Well, well, exactly. Which is which is your concern from the beginning? Which they alone, like that alone, they're all like, yeah, no, definitely. If you're in if you're in a position to buy a secret thing, definitely buy a secret thing now because you can sell it later. Yeah. Uh. All right. So we'll hold off. We're uploading it now.